in America and the Ancien Regime and the Revolution, in which he discusses the political revolutions in America and France in the late 18th century. Across the two books, he sets out a case for the American Revolution, its War of Independence, and the French Revolution, to be understood as world historical moments that come to define the political dilemmas of modernity associated with the rise of equality. Tocqueville's central thesis is seemingly simple. In the US, he argues, democracy followed from a pre-existing social equality which was a consequence of the nature of how its settlers had sought to escape the bounds of feudal social order. In contrast, in France, the claim to political equality, democracy, confronted social inequality and hierarchies of rank in the wider society. The key difference between the revolutions, he argues, is that while the former could be represented as the pure spirit of democracy, France provided an example of political democracy developing as despotism. However, that also indicated a risk of democracy, even in the former, that it could develop as a tyranny of the majority. What Tocqueville misses in both, however, were the broader colonial conditions of the political institutions and processes he was analysing. In describing democracy, he self-consciously omits direct treatment of those who are dispossessed in the process of settlement and those whose movement is forced. France, like England, Great Britain after 1707, had begun a process of colonisation in the 16th century and was consolidating its incursions into Africa with the invasion of Algeria in 1830, which was around the time that Tocqueville visited the US. Equally, the United States was beginning its process of territorial expansion, out from the original 13 colonies on the eastern seaboard. Indeed, Tocqueville anticipated US expansion to the western seaboard, that is, the creation of an empire, and not simply a settler nation. In this session, I examine Tocqueville's understanding of democracy in the light of the presence of indigenous peoples and the relations between the races that inhabit the US. This is followed by a discussion of two other sites of political conflict and their place in Tocqueville's deliberations on political modernity. These are Algeria, the country colonised by France in the pursuit of imperial ambitions, and Haiti, the French colony that liberated itself from colonial rule and enslavement in the years of the French Revolution. In the long chapter that until recently was abridged from US editions of Democracy in America, Tocqueville clearly stated that the land of the United States was occupied by three races and that his account of democracy was about only one of them. This was because the history of the other two, indigenous peoples and Africans brought there under slavery, was of their subjugation by the very institutions and practices that were otherwise being praised as embodying democracy. He wrote that the positions of these two groups, and I quote, were tangential to my subject, they are American, but not democratic. Both groups, he continued, suffer the effects of tyranny, and while their miseries are different, both can blame those miseries on the same tyrant. The displacement of indigenous peoples was a process continuous with the development of the colonies and their expansion after independence. The initial processes included the dispossession of indigenous nations from the territories consolidated as the 13 colonies. The Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which more than doubled the territory claimed by European settlers, and the further westward expansion authorised by the 1830 Indian Removal Act. The only prediction Tocqueville offered for the fate of the indigenous population pointed bleakly to their extermination. He states, I believe that the Indian race in North America is doomed. And I cannot help thinking that by the time Europeans have settled the Pacific coast, it will have ceased to exist. He was aware of a contradiction within the social and political community of modern democratic America, 
that was posed by the treatment of enslaved Africans and the founding and continuing dispossession of indigenous peoples. However, his central argument about democracy is buttressed by an implicit idea of stadial development where, uh, where earlier societies are doomed to be surpassed. The situation is different with regard to enslaved Africans. He regarded their treatment as a denial of the rights otherwise being promoted, but at the same time understood their presence as potentially one of the most serious dangers confronting the new society. On the one hand, he wrote, and I quote, between the extreme inequality created by slavery and the complete equality to which independence naturally leads, there is no durable intermediate state. Europeans with respect to the black man violated all the rights of humanity and then schooled him in the value and inviolability of those rights. Having described slavery as an evil, Tocqueville then inverted the problem, stating that, and again I quote, the most redoubtable of all the ills that threaten the future of the United States stems from the presence of blacks on its soil. They were seen to be a threat to the system of possession instituted by white settlers and as such constituted a rebuke to European ideas of liberty which were bound up with ideas of private property. It is this that helps us to make sense of Tocqueville's failure to mention the French colony of Saint-Domingue, or Haiti, as it came to be known. Revolts by enslaved people in Saint-Domingue in the early 1790s led to the abolition of slavery there in 1793. This decree, abolishing slavery, was ratified in Paris at the National Convention in February 1794 and it was extended to all French overseas colonies. Napoleon's attempt to restore slavery in the French colonies in 1802 then was an active attempt to enslave citizens and it led to extensive protests in Saint-Domingue. The revolts this time led to the assertion of complete independence from France, the renaming of the island as Haiti and the reassertion of the abolition of slavery. It is unlikely that Tocqueville was unaware of this history or the resistance to tyranny it symbolised. And yet, as Nesbitt argues, he completely suppresses the events of the Haitian Revolution from his narrative. In part, this was because of the threat posed by the self-abolition of slavery to French colonial interests more broadly. When Tocqueville does discuss abolition, his arguments are primarily organised around a concern to manage an orderly process of emancipation that would not adversely affect colonial economies or their beneficiaries. His solution was for the state to compensate all slave owners and for it then to be reimbursed through a tax on the wages of freed slaves who would be apprenticed to the state for a transition period. In this way, those who had been enslaved would be paying reparations to those who had enslaved them for their loss of property, but there was no consideration that those who had been enslaved might be compensated for their loss of liberty. The French principles of equality that Tocqueville espoused then were consistent, at least in his own mind, with colonial domination as an expression of French national interests. Moreover, this included the subjection of local populations in colonial settlements, even where enslavement was not endorsed. This was evident in Tocqueville's Letters to Algeria, published in 1837. France had initially invaded Algiers in 1830, leading to a decade of restricted occupation before embarking in the 1840s on the total conquest and colonisation of the area under the command of General Bougeot. Bougeot advocated for and implemented the razia, which meant that, as Richter argues, villages were raised, harvests burned, livestock confiscated or slaughtered, and certain resisting tribes 
which sought refuge in caves, were smoked to death. The actions of the French army in Algeria were criticised by many in the Chamber of Deputies. Tocqueville's response was more ambivalent and cannot be understood separately from his commitment to the French nation and to his belief in the signal importance of French imperialism to its stability and future flourishing. As Jennifer Pitts writes, and I quote, 19th century France's unstable and unsettling domestic regime led many liberals to embrace imperialism as a kind of national salvation. Empire, then, was Tocqueville's solution to the travails of building a stable national community. While Tocqueville can be seen to have at least been sympathetic to the claims of indigenous peoples in the Americas, and those who had been transported there and coerced to labour on plantations, he seemed unable to apply those, albeit limited, insights to aspects of European and particularly French colonialism beyond the New World. However, I suggest that Tocqueville's arguments about the US might be better understood if they were reinterpreted in the light of his comments on Algeria. The democracy that he found in, in America, and to which he was sympathetic, was racialized. Tocqueville was willing to restrict the functioning of democracy along these lines in service of French colonial interests, just as he recognized similar interests at play in other European powers and endorsed them as reflecting European superiority. Scholars have long sought to reconcile the Tocqueville sympathetic to increasing equality between the races in America with the Tocqueville that rejoices at the colonial victories of Europeans and their submission of other races. However, as Stokes argues, the problem with this idea of there being two Tocquevilles or two separate voices is that it fails to recognise that the unifying racial theme in Tocqueville's writings is the marginalising of the cultures of people of colour. For all of Tocqueville's anguish at the violence meted out to indigenous peoples and enslaved Africans, there was no concomitant critique of the colonial processes of expansion and conquest by European nations. The threat to democracy in America that he perceived might follow from the emancipation of enslaved Africans seems instead to have taken the form of a tyranny of the white majority over a racialised minority. <laughs>